Hello and welcome to the Two Robbies podcast, your destination for in-depth discussion and analysis of the Premier League and the Champions League. I'm Robbie Earl, and today I've got a special guest. Mr Musto's having a weekend off, so my studio buddy Tim Howard joins me, and here are today's topics. Casemiro saves Manchester United with a late goal at Stamford Bridge. Erling Haaland shines again with a brace against Brighton. Arsenal stumble as it ends 1-1 at St Mary's. Nottingham Forest get a massive result at Liverpool's expense. Tottenham fail to bounce back in a loss at home versus Newcastle. And Aston Villa get an impressive win after firing Steven Gerrard. That's what we've got coming up in today's episode. OK, Timbo, let's um, kick off. We've had a weekend together in the studio. We can kick back a little bit on, yeah. on the podcast and, and look at it. In depth at a couple of the games. Let's start at Stamford Bridge. I think that was a big game for the weekend. Um, it ended 1 1. Um, it was almost one of those tactical kind of purist games mm. where there was, you know, one manager was trying one system with set of players, the other would counter, and we saw that going on. Mm. Scoreline was 0 0. And then we got two late goals. Um, first of all, where, where were you in terms of Manchester United having beaten Spurs uh, so well? midweek. Where did you see them and how did you think it played out for, for United and Ten Hag in his kind of development of what he's looking for, for Manchester United? Well, first of all, let, let me say thanks for having me. I, I, I'm Thank you, Musty, for taking the weekend off. <laughs> yeah. It's always a joy to be on the Two Robbies podcast. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of uh, Manchester United and Ten Hag in this process and because it's Manchester United, we know people don't get time in the Premier League, but because mm-hmm. it's Manchester United, it's like have to win a trophy now. They're not close to winning a trophy, and that's okay. But what they are close to is a, a process with a really good manager who has an idea of how he likes his teams to play. He has an idea of the type of profile of player he wants to bring into the club. He's done that. By the way, he's had one transfer window, right, and, and 10 games or 11 games. So this is I like, where, I like his tactical style. Again, he, he's, not a, he's not a yeller. He's not a shouter. He does things in a, in a very practical way. He thinks through the game. He gets the best out of his team. I like where this Manchester United team is going. And throughout this process, you have to show grit and determination, and they showed that at Stamford Bridge. I was, I was in, interested, though, because I have to say I was a little surprised that he made a change. One tweak in midfield, Eriksen came into the game and Fred went yeah. to the bench. Based on what Fred had done in the previous mm. game, based on the team setup, I just thought he'll leave things the same and not. I got the sense that by putting Eriksen in, whether it was to do with fitness or not, there was no talk of that, but it was almost like... He wanted to get more possession in the middle of the yeah. field. He wanted somebody who could keep the ball and co- have a continuity player who could join it yeah. up. And Ericsson, we know, does that better than Fred. Yeah, look, I think I think a winning team oftentimes picks itself, but it's not as easy as that. Every now and again, a manager is going to prefer a certain player over another. Quite frankly, Casemiro and Ericsson, to me, uh, are the is the partnership in the middle of midfield for Manchester United that I think is the best one, as you mentioned. They're going to keep possession. They have the keys to unlock the door of a lot of these uh, Premier League defenses. So Fred, although he's coming off the back of a good game, he'll be disappointed, but that's okay. Mm. We, again, we talk about Manchester United. Competition for places is yeah. is a prerequisite for playing at Manchester United. It was interesting, though, because for 30 minutes, I thought United had the better things. Mm-hmm. I think there's a real control now about their football. I think there's a, is a, is an organisation. As I watch them, I, you can almost see what they're trying to do, which hasn't been the case yeah. in, in the past. Yeah. And to the point where... I thought Chelsea were, were, were second in, in many parts of the game. And Graham Potter, obviously, at the side, as we know, is, is a master tactician and mm. likes to think, made a big call with just over 30 minutes on the clock, 35 minutes on the clock. He took out Kukurea, mm. who was one of his uh, three centre-backs, was left-side centre-back. He went to a back four, so Chilwell went from wing-back to mm. left-back. Aspilicueta um, was, was in there as, as, as right-back. They had a, a back four with... A diamond in midfield. So he put Jorginho at, at the base of the diamond, Kovacic one side, Loftus cheek the other, and Mount at the top of the pitch mm. because he wanted extra numbers in midfield so he could dominate the game. And it was a brave move, and it was a move that I thought affected United a little bit yeah. and got them back into the game. Yeah, it, you know it's funny. Uh, uh, people laugh all the time because I get I, I get asked this random question: If you could change one thing about football, <laughs> what, what would it be? And I and I say timeouts, and people look at me and scout. And I yeah. say the reason for that is. Managers prepare their team, mm. as you and I both know. We've been on a training yeah. ground for yeah. thousands and thousands of hours. 
They prepare their team all week. The whistle blows. Yeah. Something changes. They have to make a tweak. And, and basically, they have to wait 45 minutes yeah. before they can really impact the team, mm. right, to get into the dressing yeah, room. That's a good point. And what I like about, you know, people moan and groan about the, sub, the, the new substitution rule yeah. and how many subs, what it allows the managers to do, like Ten Hag, like Potter, who are who their football IQ is through the roof. They yeah. know tactically how they mm. want to play. They don't have to wait. Grand Potter made that change at the 36 minute. Yeah. Unlucky for Kukurea. Yeah. It, he'll be upset that he gets hooked before halftime. But the fact of the matter was, because of the new substitution rule, Grand Potter said, you know what? I see something I don't like. I'm at home. I'm getting outmatched yeah. in the midfield. Yeah. I have to make a change. And it allows him to do that. And so obviously, as you know, from the outside watching this, it's it's brilliant to see. It's a yeah. chess match, really. Yeah. And then the counter change came in the second yes. half. So as Chelsea were building up a, a, a little bit of momentum, then Ten Hag decides, right, I'm going to take Sancho off, put Fred mm -hmm. into my midfield. We're going to even up. We'll go with the diamond, Casemiro at the base, Bruno Fernandes at the top, and Fred and Eriksen either side. And all of a sudden, then they got back into game. It was a real yeah. ebb and flow of tactical play. Going into the game a little bit more, we, we, we'll start with Man, stay with Man United as we start, and then we'll get into Chelsea. But right now, Manchester United, to me, look a very capable, controlled, organised side. They're an attacking forward short of being mm. really good. Now, J Jaden Sancho has been outstanding for, for, for Dortmund, has mm. come into Manchester United. He had a difficult time last season when he, it was his first year and people said he's settling in. The system now is in place. The, the, he's, he's got a position on the left-hand side. He still feels to me, Tim, like Jaden Sancho hasn't quite found himself in the Red of mm. Manchester United. Why do you think that might be? What, what, what might be holding him back now? It's, you know, it's not that they were disorganised before, they didn't have a shape, they didn't yeah, have a system. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of that is in place now. This should be for his time to come. He almost looks a little bit, dare I say, fearful. When he, yes. He's playing safe. He, he, he's playing like Jack Grealish when he first went to Man City. I won't take somebody on. I'll, I'll, I'll cut, turn back mm. and give it to my full back. Mm. Give that isn't what Jaden Sancho is about. I don't know. I don't quite know. I can't quite get to my head around what, what, where he's at. Yeah, it gives me the same feeling. Um, look, some, some footballers are just pretty players. They're pretty footballers. It looks good. They're tidy on the ball. Gosh, you could watch him train mm. all day. But I think he does lack the aggression. And, and, and oftentimes, Robbie, price tags can be really deceiving. Yeah. You know, I think, I think British players, English players, the, the price tag is inflated, of course, yeah. but he's a good player. But nearly close enough to $100 million for yeah. him. It's a big fee. United chased him for two summers. They finally got him. Maybe, maybe he's not the, that player. Maybe he's just a very smooth, cool, calm player. And really, in this system, yeah. Ten Hag needs an aggressive mm. winger. That because, because by the way, they're really good in possession. They're yeah. going to get fullbacks yeah, isolated. Yeah. And when those fullbacks get isolated, the job is the profile is drive at them. Doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you make a mistake. Drive at those players. Get into the penalty area. Penalty area entries are yeah, key, yeah. and we don't really see that from him. Mm. And, and it's a shame because on one side you've got Anthony who's going to give goals, yeah. and, and now in, in any Premier League system, the wide players have to contribute with goals and assists. Mm. It, it's absolutely key yeah. for any successful teams. You've got to get goals from wide. So a little bit of an issue for, for Manchester United. Let, let, let's turn it to Chelsea, who, as I say, Graham Potter made a change. Was sort of. I always felt Chelsea were a little bit second best in, mm. in this game. I never quite felt there was a real period. They had a little spell in the second half where it looked like, but couldn't get many looks for Aubameyang, couldn't quite get Sterling in, 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 in the right spots in and around, in Mount, in and around, around the box. I thought this was one of those games where Graham Potter maybe learned a little bit about his team, like mm. in terms of, you know, they, they didn't have as much possession, they didn't dominate the games as, as we've seen of late, and they had, they had to find another way to, to get it. To get the uh, result, yeah, and and I think again, Graham, undefeated under Graham Potter, so mm. that's a that's a yeah. Particularly when a new manager, you're going up a level because yeah. clearly Chelsea is is, is mm -hmm. a far cry from Brighton. You have to prove your worth, so he's starting to do that. The, you know, the the questions initially are just going to disappear because they're undefeated, and he's yeah. a really good manager. You talk about United being short on that on that wing. I, I think Chelsea and they have been short of a of a proper goal scorer. You know, Kai mm. Havertz comes in. Is he a winger? Is he a false nine? Is he a nine? He's played in all those positions. He's not someone who's going to consistently get you 15 goals a season. Um, is no Obama Young that guy? No, then? I don't. I don't think so. I, I really don't. I, I think. Mm. I think he was because they were short there, and because yeah. he was available. 
and because he was a Tuchel guy, okay. right, from, from, yeah. from many years ago in Germany, I think it made sense. I don't know if, if Chelsea have a, a sheet of strikers yeah, that they go and get Aubameyang. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I think right now he fits that, but they're still short. They're mm. still really short. And, and to be fair, he seems to be getting hauled off before 90 minutes is up every week yeah. that he's been playing yeah. anyway. So um, I, would Im- I would imagine the way and the style that we know that Potter likes to play, that's going to be his priority list. Let's quickly touch on the two goals because we, we had a friendly debate <laughs> in, 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 the, um, in the studio about First one was McTominay was on mm. his sub against mm. Broya. Um, Broya's trying to get towards uh, the corner that was taken. McTominay puts two hands around him. We've just done a tactic session mm-hmm. on on the the same thing, looking at, at the tactics of the game and the two goals. And I think the point being, you know, I thought it was a penalty shot. Mm-hmm. I, I just thought it was too much uh, physical holding by McTominay. Uh, I know he's trying to restrict him. Again, you you came out today and, and made a really valid point. It, sometimes it's not the holding; mm. it's the length of yeah. time you you hold. Just want to explain that for, for yeah. Oh. So so Robbie, I think when you if if you took a snapshot of every set piece, mm. wide 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 free kick corner kicks, you you're, you're going to see nearly twenty players with physical contact with their mm. arms around each other with with a fistful of jersey. Referees aren't going to initially call that a penalty; yeah. they're going to allow yeah. that to play out. Duration, and that's the key word about duration, referees are going to allow you to, to bear hug players mm. standing still, mm. maybe the first step or two. They're going to allow you to grab a fistful of shirt. That's no problem. When the shirt gets stretched or the duration of this quote-unquote bear hug takes a player all the way to the ground, even if, it's, even if the ball is unplayable, yeah. the referees are now going to call that. So defending players have to realize they can have the physical yeah. contact. They just have to be mindful of the duration of that contact. Yeah, it's a really good point. And uh, as you say, sometimes it might clear up the, you know, is it a penalty, isn't it a mm. penalty, depending on if you're grabbing hold of and it's happening as the uh, free kick's being taken or corner's being taken, then you're going to get caught. It's interesting, the second, the, uh, the equalising goal after Giorgino scored the penalty. Casemiro with the header. Mm. Not quite sure what he's doing up there. Chelsea <laughs> didn't do a good job of, of clearing the ball, but uh, Shaw puts the ball in. Casemiro has the header. And my first reaction was, was to want to see if it was over line. Then, you know, I'm thinking about the header and how mm. great it was. And, and you, first of all, sort of went, Kepa won't be happy with that. And it, and it, it was a thought that never came into mm. my head as somebody who's never played in goal and, and not thought like a goalkeeper. But it was really interesting your view, and, and obviously love that for our viewers to hear it, in that you feel if Kepa gets what you call as a good hand mm-hmm. on the ball, mm-hmm. you feel he'd be disappointed yeah. it ends up in the back of his neck. Yeah, look, experience ex- experience tells me, because I've, I've, I've had talking tos by my defenders, mm-hmm. yeah. I've gotten the nasty look from my <laughs> defenders. There's a high expectation at that level of goalkeepers, rightfully so, and he's the most expensive goalkeeper in, in world football. Yeah. But... He, when you when you when you go to bed at night as a goalkeeper and you analyze the game as all players do, he'll look at the goal. There's two parts to it. It's a very good header. Mm. Take nothing away from Casemiro in the header. It's a great equalizer, very mm. deserving. As a goalkeeper, when you get a full hand to it, a good, strong, firm hand to the ball, the expectation of yourself is that you keep that ball out. Now, right. there are there's one caveat to that rule. If you get beat for pace, if a, if a guy literally just smashes a ball past you and and it forces your hand back and it goes in. You might be a little bit disappointed, mm-hmm. but you can accept that because you've been beaten for pace. Yeah. That was kind of a little bit of a loopy header. He gets a good push on it, Keppa, and gets a good hand to it. He will have – forget outside critics. Yeah. He will have thought to himself, that's a match-winning save I should be making, and we should be out of here with all three points. I wasn't going to talk about him, but I, I think we should. <laughs> it, it's a day when it was going to be a no CR7 day, um, and United got a good, good mm. uh, point at Stamford Bridge without him. We just finished this match on Ronaldo because all the headlines were obviously what happened midweek, that he walked down the touchline, didn't want to come on the pitch, mm. that he was um, not in the match day squad. On Monday, Ten Hag has said that, you know, he's back involved and they've got, I think, between now and the winter, uh, the, the World Cup break, I think these six games, four league games, mm. two Europa games. Does he just come back part of things and we, we, we get on with business as it was? Does, much, does anything change? Would you integrate him in what you, mm. you know, we've seen two decent results off the yeah. back of that. Do, do you integrate him? Where are we with Ten Hag? You've been in a dressing with yeah. Ronaldo. You, you know the man. God, it just feels so weird, Rob. It's a soap opera, and I know it's going, always going to mm. be. You can't, I, I, if anybody's excusing his behavior, shame yeah. on them. Yeah, no, one's, yeah. no one's excusing that behavior. You shouldn't walk down the touchline before the game's over. The, my, my issue is, 
this was never, you know this, this was never going to end good. Mm. Ronaldo leaving United wasn't going to end good. Mm. It didn't end good in the summer when he put in a transfer, or not put in a transfer, yeah. asked to leave late. They allowed him to leave. There was no suitors, apparently. Then you put him on the bench. He's last year's leading goal scorer. He's, he's arguably one of the best football players in the history of football. It's, I think Ten Hag was a little naive to go, oh, he'll be fine sitting on the bench. Because think about it. They got... They got brushed aside in the Derby, 6'3". Mm. He has to come out and address the fact that with, with respect to Ronaldo and his career, I didn't want to put him on. So it's always been that, even in the quote-unquote good times. Yeah. Um, so I think it's been an issue. I don't particularly see how he comes back. I don't think – I think there should be a mutual understanding. Look, we have three or four games to, to the break. Yeah. You're not going to be involved. Let's do everything we, mm. we possibly can, again, out of respect, yeah. to get you out of the football club to where you want to be. But listen, this was never, ever, ever going to end good. And, that, and it's showing that I don't know how he comes back. Yeah. I don't know how he comes back into the team because th then what? So you have to start him, really, which I don't think is going to happen. So then what? You go, he goes back on the bench again? It just doesn't seem – it seems – Seems it's all interesting. I, I just wonder if, if maybe for Europa League games he feels that he can be a benefit. What I, what I have liked about Ten Hag is he hasn't totally shut the door. He hasn't said mm. you're never going to play again, which mm. I think is important. He's left it slightly ajar. I think there might be times that, listen, if he can use Cristiano Ronaldo to his benefit, Manchester United's benefit, then I think you do that until a point where you're exactly right. There will be a parting of ways. It's not going to be particularly pretty. Ronaldo's Ronaldo and wants to go yeah. be the man somewhere. Manchester United have other things, but two decent performances for United uh, should give Ten Hag yeah. a little bit of confidence and belief and hopefully support in what he decides is the right way yes. forward for, for this football club. And just, just closing on this one, um, I know Rafael Varane went down a little bit awkward yesterday. I've not heard anything too much what that could be, but hopefully it's not your body. He's obviously in tears and, yeah. and we're, we're, we're fingers crossed that he's able to make the World Cup. OK, my friend, let, let's move things on. Um, Big game today was mm. at White Hart Lane. Or, sorry, White Hart Lane, the new Spurs Stadium. Yeah. Um, it was Tottenham versus Newcastle. Two teams who we think, well, certainly Tottenham will feel they can be somewhere in the top four. Mm. Newcastle, potentially, and uh, Antonio Conte talked about it in his press conference, like, you know, they're a top four team of the future. He said they're possible title winners of the future. They're possibly Champions League winners of the future, such as the... Uh, resource behind the mm. football club. They haven't particularly spent a load of money. They're doing it in a different way, but they went to Tottenham and come away with a 2-1 victory. And for Eddie Howe in Newcastle, um, I've got to say, uh, before I pass on, mate, it's been done in a, in a method, in a way, that I wasn't sure when. I wasn't actually sure Eddie Howe was the, the right guy to take them right. to where they want. I always thought Eddie Howe might be a stopgap. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be... That mm -hmm. definitely is not the case, and, and it's a credit to him. I looked. At, I look at the team sheet, um, Tim. I was looking at the other day, and I was thinking, Dan Byrne wouldn't <laughs> have been in my thought that he'd be in their team. Willock, Longstaff, Almiron, Joe Ellington. Mm. I'm thinking they wouldn't be in my now super powered, sure, super rich sure. Newcastle. We're going to top six team. Yet they've all been super important. They've all played their part, and have a real kind of team spirit and ethic about them. And, and, and Eddie Howe said in the press conference just before the game, something special is happening in this football mm -hmm. club. He said you feel it when you're yeah. within it. And um, I, I think we're starting to see that on the pitch. Well, listen, I, I always make the comparison with this Newcastle takeover mm. to when I was playing in the Premier League and Manchester City were taking over. Yeah. They said, we have all the money in the world. I've got an idea. We're going to get the best world-class yeah. manager. We're going to buy all the best players and we're going to win. No, you're not. No, you're not. And they yeah, didn't. Yeah. And they had to go through your Rabinos and all these different players, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right, and cycle them out before they became what we now know as Manchester City, or yeah. the Manchester City. So what I like about Newcastle, you hit the nail on the head, there's a bunch of players that probably when this team gets to the peak of what they are, they are and who they are, yeah. won't be there. Mm. But you need to be able to build that foundation. And that's a better way, that slow and steady progress, tempering expectations is a better way than going, ha ha, we've got it all figured out, we've got all this money, we're gonna buy all these top players. Because guess what, you're not. The fact of the matter is, top players wanna be playing in Champions League. Yeah. So at a bare minimum, no sense in going out and buying all these top yeah. players who might be B-list celebrities instead of the A-list yeah. ones you want. Yeah. Get yourself into Champions League, certainly Europa League, yeah. then start buying a play. This is a this is a process. I mean, Eddie Howe for me is the right man for the job, but this is a 
three, four, five year process before they really hit their stride. It's really interesting because as we're watching the game and, and, and we talked to Ahmed who, who was in the host seat um, this weekend and he was sort of saying, you know, what do you see in these two, you mm. know, what, what are Newcastle? And it's really interesting. I, I was thinking about these are two both well-coached teams, yeah. Tottenham and Newcastle. For Tottenham, Antonio Conte does all his work on the training ground, it defensively not being, being hard to break mm. down and it's a team formation. It's not just a back three or back five. You know, it includes the forwards in his team. We're compact, we're deep, we defend, we're hard to play. And that's how he wants to win games on turnovers and transitions. Everybody knows mm -hmm. that. Eddie Howe does his work, but he does it at the other end of the pitch. Yeah. He does his work on, we're going to press, we're going to be aggressive, we're going to have energy, we're going to win the ball. And when we win the ball, then we're going to attack people yeah. and make things happen. So one's doing it in, in a, on the back foot pragmatic. The other's doing it with a progressive kind of forward thinking way of coaching. And you can see the, the, the word that comes out of, of my mind when I think about Newcastle is there's a joy about their work. Mm. There's a smile about the way they're going about the business. For Spurs, even sometimes in victory, it doesn't look that enjoyable. Mm. And I just wonder, you know, Robbie must have, I think, said last week on, on air, like I think someone said, is there a plan B? And he said, no, we're just going to have to do better at plan A. <laughs> and I think that is what Conte is. Yeah. You know, finding a better way of plan A. But yeah. when they're 2-0 down, are we ever going to see a different Conte? Are they ever going to play a different way? Or, or is he just going to have to get better at what mm. he does and how he does it? Yeah, it's a great lead-in. Things aren't always what they seem because what I see here is Tottenham are third yeah. in the Premier League table. Mm. Brilliant. I've said this before. I'll continue to say because it doesn't feel right. They were down 2-0 to Leicester at home, I believe. Mm. Son comes on, scores a hat yeah. trick, sparks the... the the comeback. When I look at Tottenham, right, there's some stats jumped out at me. They coming into today's game, yeah, they conceded 173 shots. Yeah, okay, yeah. that was third, well, no, third, no, third most, most in the in the Premier League. Yeah, on average, yeah. they're giving up 15 shots per game. Yeah, okay, against Man United, they gave up 28 shots 28. A, a, a game Correct. in the game. They're less. They're the only Big Six team. With less than 50 percent that of possession, yeah, possession, that speaks to yeah, yeah, how they sit back. Yeah. Today, Newcastle had 13 shots on goal. My point to you is, in the Premier League, mm. if you press and you're dogged and you and you get up against people, they're still going to find ways to get shots away. Yeah. If you go into these games, you concede space, you concede opportunities, mm. you're going to concede goals, even against average Newcastle, not average, yeah, even against yeah. average Premier League yeah, teams yeah. like Leicester is because they're, they're at the bottom. Mm -hmm. You're going to concede yeah. goals and goals are the hardest thing to do in football is scoring a goal. Mm. So now you put yourself at a disadvantage. Yes, they got brilliant attacking flair and Kane and Son. We know that and Kulisewski to come and all the others. But you, you can't you, you can't go into a game. That's why this is deceiving to me. Tottenham, I'm thinking if they play the rest of the season with no plan B. And continue to concede 15 shots on yeah. a, a, a game. There's good enough players in this yeah. league that are going to turn 15 into one or two goals. Absolutely, It's interesting. So it's a really interesting point because I, I was a big advocate of, of the Conte team that won the title with, with Chelsea. And mm -hmm. it was the first coach who'd ever won the team playing three at the back. And it, yeah. was, it was something that new and different to, to English football. But that team he had had some magnificent players. And the one thing I would say with that team is it was hard to get a shot against. Yeah. They, yeah. they weren't. There weren't 15 shots coming in at a goal. They, mm -hmm. they they got you know. I think they had something like 12 or 13 clean sheets that that season. Yeah. You know they had stellar defenders, stellar um, people in, in in goal. And let me pause you there, and I want you to keep going. Tottenham's defenders aren't very good. Sorry, sorry to be to yeah. to, to yeah. Give they're, a not, they're, not they're not that Chelsea level. They're not Chelsea level. They're not Chelsea level. They're not, they're that not Chelsea John level. Terry and the no. rest. Like the, no. these, you're going to. Put the onus on them to defend. Mm. I mean, I watched Longley today. Yeah. He, he was a got statue. Exposed, he, he got exposed. He got ran by. Mm. San, David Sanchez. He he's in and out of the team. Dyer, okay, he's a good defender uh, at times, but he's not. He's not yeah. a world beater. And yeah, the wingbacks, they haven't done a good enough job in recruitment. Yeah. So yeah. like, it's not a good defense defensive unit. So they did have a couple of injuries. Romero was injured. Yeah. Hoy Bear was injured. Yeah. Who's been energetic yeah. and scored goals. So you know they may point to that, but. I, I think there, there seemed to be a theme w with Spurs, mm -hmm. and I think it's one of those situations where, listen, well, you, you'll take your wins the way they play, and you know you've got people up front, Kane and Son, mm -hmm. certainly not so, but who are scoring goals. And I think the days when it doesn't go well, I think the way they play, they, there's going to be some criticism. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. But we'll have to see how this sh- one shakes out. Let's talk about Conte um, talking about a new contract. But from Newcastle mm. point of view, uh, set forth in the table right now. Um, must be looking forward to the next three or four games to the winter to the World Cup break. And Eddie Howe and his team, I think, are, are, are probably overachieving a little bit yeah. in terms of, of what they've got. And, and the man management of people like Al Moron and, and Joe Ellington has been sort of exceptional. And also, you got to think, St. Maximin wasn't around and right. Isaac wasn't around right. at the moment. Right. You know, you, you, still got, you still got to have those players yeah. in. But yeah, great day for Newcastle away at Tottenham. Um, we saw the Newcastle fans in all the pouring rain with, it, with their tops off and supporting the <laughs> team. And it's nice to see uh, some smiles on faces because they've had some difficult times over the last few years. Let's move it to Manchester City versus Brighton. Um, I think we all felt that this one was going to be a Manchester City home win. Mm. I think we all felt that Erling Haaland would score at least one goal. He got a brace on, on this one. Um, got the job done in the end. Um, we talked a bit of Haaland uh, in the boot room today uh, as one of our studio shows and talked mm. about the unique aspects that he brings to the league. Um, it was interesting. Kevin De Bruyne just said, we just play to his strengths. Yeah. It was almost like he said, nothing up to change. We, it, it, is he going to hit 40 goals? I think 40 goals would be a, a magnificent se- season, clearly. Do I think he'll break the goal streaming record single season? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Will he be the golden boot winner? Absolutely. 40, it's a blistering pace. Um, but, yeah, I think he can get there. And, and, and City just continue to, to go from strength to strength. Um, Pep's talked about the humility with his team mm-hmm. being a big thing. I, I, and I listened in his press conference. He said, you know, what we do week in, week out, it could be about managing minutes now for, for yeah. teams like City because, obviously, every two or three days, these are the Premier League game or a mm. Champions League game up through to, and cup games coming up, up through till the, the, the break. So managing minutes for players might might be key bef- before between now and then. Yeah, look, I, I mean, if you're not impressed with City, you're not a football fan, whether you, whether you support them or not, yeah. the fact that Pep can continue to motivate himself and his team mm. year in, year out, to, to play a certain way, to be responsible with the football, to give energy in that high-pressing system, which they press all over the pitch for 90 minutes, it, it which is in, nearly impossible to do, you just it, it leaves you in awe of this football club and and these players because they continue to do it. most of the games they play are like training sessions they dominate so much they never get bored they continue to stay motivated so it's a big credit to them another great Kevin De Bruyne goal as well from from outside the box we, we, we were fortunate to to speak to Kevin um, after the game he gave us a few good insights mm. question I was down to ask him was why he's got that black eye by the way hopefully <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out in a few days time but wasn't quite the right time to maybe ask him that question. Just a quick one on on Brighton because um, not quite the start that mm. Roberto De Zerbi would want. And they had the three three draw um, with Liverpool on, yeah. on his first game, but since then they've had a couple of defeats and, mm-hmm. and a couple of draws, and he hasn't, he hasn't got his first win yet. I remember saying last week in, 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 at the fan fest, and I said to Beck, you know, let's, I don't want to go over the top here, and it's not yeah. like sack this guy. But I said, football coaches, when somebody new comes into your club, yeah. uh, Tim. They always want to win because it almost brings an air of confidence, an air of belief in what they're doing. I think it's four games now, no, no wins. Yeah. All of a sudden, if that becomes five and six, like, not questions are asked. He's not going to get the sack. But no. all of a sudden, like, you know, the dressing room, we've been in dressing rooms, we're going like, hmm, yeah. Gaffer hasn't, hasn't got a win yet. Yeah, you know, I think the, when, you, when you said it last weekend at the Fan Fest, it almost, it, it almost felt premature, but what a yeah. difference a week makes, right? And so I think it was the foresight on your part to say, like, if you don't get – winning is everything in, yeah. in, in, in football. He just got hired. Is he getting the sack? No, of course he's not. No one's suggesting that. Yeah. But ultimately, you have to win football matches. Mm. They haven't done that. And the hard part for De Zerbe, who I think is a good manager, yeah. is he's taking over from, let's call it what you know a Brighton club legend because of what he's done. Yeah, and Potter's okay. gone on yeah. you know, to, to Chelsea – but the fact of the matter is they play a similar style of football, mm. right? So so the tweaks and the growth aren't going to be massive. There's yeah, nothing that, yeah. now if he came in and he played a whole different system and he played a, and he had a different mentality, okay, that would be different. We'd yeah, see it straight away. Yeah, yeah. But his tweaks to this team are going to be very hard to detect. Mm. And the best way that we're gonna see that is is through good results. And they haven't really gotten that. Now I think it's a good enough team where they where they look they 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 had some really difficult games, Liverpool and, and City obviously yeah. being being those. But when I look at the team, I like him. I think Trossard's having a fantastic season. I think he's actually, he's actually stepped up a level, which yeah. I wasn't sure he could do. Yeah. Welbeck's just been short of goals. He looks short of confidence. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't, you know, center forward, isn't it? Center forward yeah. doesn't yeah. really ever look like scoring. So 
that's something that needs to be addressed. The good thing is uh, very soon the, the transfer window will be, be upon us. If Deserby, who has experience in Italian football, yeah. can use some of his experience to get one of the, one or two of those players in at the front end of the pitch, I think they'll be okay. Yeah, I don't think there's any real pressure on no. Deserby right now. It's not a club that, that's going to hire and fire, but um, he'll want to get his first win under his belt as soon as he can. Let's go to St. Mary's. Uh, Southampton <laughs> versus Arsenal. Arsenal um, come off... Uh, Europa League win that pretty much assures their place in, mm. in, in the uh, knockout stage. It's interesting with that one because um, Mikel Arteta has been playing quite a strong team in, yeah. in Europa League. The likes of, of Jacko and Jesus mm. and Saka have, have been playing. And he came out this week and said, you know, players have got to get used to playing two or three days. This was a game where Arsenal got themselves ahead with uh, Jacko coming up with another goal, but ended up sort of, been a little bit sloppy, let Southampton back into the game and, and couldn't find a winner. Is he right, Mikel? Is, mm. is, 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 you know, is the mentality just, we've got games, we play games, yeah. we're not going to let tiredness and things take mm. over, or, or might you have to be a little bit more careful? You know, Mikel being a former teammate of mine, I respect <laughs> yeah. him yeah. to the hills, and I just think he's a, he's a brilliant leader, and what he's done in management so mm -hmm. far has been fantastic. I would question a little bit, Robbie, because I think... He's right in saying they got to get used to it. Yeah. They got to get up. They, they got to mm -hmm. be up for two games every yeah. week. But at the end of the day, it's not Champions League, it's Europa League. And what I'm saying is that's all well and good to say that in August. Mm. But when we get to nearly November yeah. and you're top of the Premier League table, I need that to be prioritized. I need yeah. him to prioritize. As, you know, if you're an Arsenal supporter thinking, mm. we're in with a shout here. Like, this isn't like a really good little run in, yeah. in, at the yeah, back yeah, end of August. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah, we're yeah, real we're, title we're contenders shape, now. Yeah. And probably in the driver's seat. So, look, I think he should prioritize that. Um, today's not not monumental. It's a mm. slip up. There, yeah. Between now and the end of the season, City and Arsenal and the others in the chasing pack are going to yeah. slip up. We'll but this is, if, if you look at it, because I think a perfect example of this, and you said it in studio today, Jesus just seemed, he started in a blistering pace and he just mm. kind of seems off, off it. And he a had a couple off. chances yeah. today that yeah. he would normally just bury. So, there is there is an argument there to say let's freshen things up a little mm. bit let's keep the, our our best players as fresh as possible. Yeah, and there's no doubt that you know the way that Arsenal have gone and, and what they've shown us already this season it's a different Arsenal than mm -hmm. we've seen before. But mm -hmm. yeah, at some point you might you might have to look to prioritise things yeah. and, and and look for stronger teams maybe on the Premier League games. Be interesting in the window as well whether whether Arsenal what I call fatten the squad up, mm -hmm. bring in a couple of players who mm -hmm. can be your Europa League players yeah. and not you know, and rest some of those Premier League players on things. Because as you say, this isn't looking like a blip or, or, or a little run. This looks like Arsenal might be in there at least sort of contending around the top end of the table. Southampton, or Southampton, Ralph Hassan, every time you think he's <laughs> under pressure, he finds a result or two. And I love it, and I love him. He's a coach. He's a pure coach. He doesn't have the money other people yeah. have. He doesn't have the resources other people have. But he gets on the training ground. He finds players. He works with players. And they find a way to, to get some you know good results and stay in the league. So uh, long mate continue to Ralph and his vests and his waistcoats <laughs> down at down at Southampton. Let's move to a, a bit of a shock of the day, really. Uh, Nottingham Forest home to Liverpool. I'm sure it's one of those games that the Forest fans were mm. were really looking for after being out of the the Premier League for what 23 years or, or, or so. Um, they they hosted Liverpool. Um, and that was about all they gave Liverpool because I thought mm -hmm. they gave, gave Liverpool a, a, a good test and it kind of brought all the doubts we had about Liverpool com yeah. coming back after, you know, last week we saw them against City, midweek against West Ham wasn't brilliant, got the win, West Ham had a couple of chances and a penalty save mm. and then you go to Nottingham Forest on a big day for Liverpool, Liverpool need to put a run together if they've got any serious intentions, first of all top four and anything beyond and it was a poor showing for, for, from Liverpool's point of view. Yeah, you know, I, I think I think going into the weekend, going into this game, we we started talking about this. This we could see Liverpool now going on yeah. a little bit of a run. Yeah. So I think this is this is a huge setback in in terms of that thinking. Liverpool under under Klopp certainly in the recent years uh, have dealt with a ton of injuries. Yeah. Uh, what do I put that down to? Bad luck? Sure, sure. There's there's times when there, it's bad luck. But they get they're getting a lot of injuries. It's it's also how they play, you know, and so he asks a lot of his players and, and, and you know, I look at Jota and Diaz and Nunez and, and Tiago, that it those are big misses for this yeah. Liverpool team. Um I it's it was a little bit disappointing now. 
credit Nottingham Forest because yeah. the atmosphere at the city ground was brilliant. The players really showed up and, and, and they didn't back down on a day when they act, when they could have. Dean Henderson in goal was mm. phenomenal. So credit to them. But again, you expect more from this Liverpool mm. team and they didn't deliver on the day. He talked about uh, in his press conference after after the game, obviously the disappointment of, of not of losing first or not getting anything for the game. But he talked about the chances they had and mm. you look at Van Dijk, mm-hmm. could have had three goals really as two yeah. headers and, yeah. and one that he puts past the post. Talks about Henderson came up with a couple of big moments. Um, they had a couple of good looks and, and didn't take them, which yeah. is not very Liverpool-like. When Liverpool are at their best, they, they're killers in, in, yeah. in and around the penalty box. Now, you might argue some of those chances fell to the wrong people, you sure. know, whether it's a Salah or, or a Firmino, maybe that they find the back of the net. But, you know, in the, in, in the past, you know, Van Dijk's come up with some big goals yeah, at big yeah. games that, that have, have meant something, that have got the team just feels like that, that bit's not, not mm. quite there. It's not quite sparking. Yeah, they're lacking that cutting edge, mm. you know, that, that, that ruthlessness that we're so used to seeing because it was like you don't want to give, as you mentioned, Liverpool chances, they'll put them away. And by the way, they'll find one. They'll grind it out. They'll press you into submission. So, like, it was, it, it, it was uncharacteristic, as you said. I, yes, maybe it did fall to the wrong person because obviously <laughs> if, it fall, you know, if that chance falls to Jota, if he's on the pitch, or Mo Salah, mm. You know, being out there, he, they probably finish it. So, again, uncharacteristic, but it's still a blip because you're thinking they're going to continue to go on and play well. They had some good results, but this is a setback. Let's give a bit of credit as well to Steve Cooper and yes. his group because I, I said on air um, when, when Armand said about the win, and I said, you know, it's his credit to Steve Cooper because all everybody talks about is the 22 players he's on the yeah. team. Everybody talks about, oh, it's hard to get a team spirit. And, well, they had a good spirit yeah. about them. They had a real will about them. But that fan bases you talked at the city ground behind the team they had a good intensity they had a good hunger I mean Yates had a chance to maybe um, get a second goal Johnson had, a, had a, a chance that he didn't quite do so well on uh, in the second half so they didn't have all the chances to 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 win the game and and the win was important because it means there's no gap I think mm. they've caught up I think there's five points now between 11th in the league and, and mm. bottom of the table where they stand at the moment so a couple of wins this this feels like it was a kind of result that can kick sort of season for you if, if you flourish. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and let me touch on that as well. I, when, you're a, when you're a team in the summer and you buy, you're looking to freshen up your squad. Mm. You're not looking to buy an entirely new squad. Yeah. We've been in there where you, you have experienced players yeah. and one or two guys come in and you go, mm-hmm. oh, man, this is going to freshen us up. Because when you bring players into a football club, the expectation is they're going to make you better, better yeah. and they're going to play. Yeah. If you bring in 22 new players, mm. they can't all play. So right from the off, yeah. they've, they've, yeah. they've put Steve Half Cooper... Half dressing room is, 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 is demotivated. Is an, it's an issue. <laughs> yeah. And so that's where... When you talk about spirit and and Steve Cooper, I mean, it has to be said, brilliant job yeah. just to because they're at the bottom of the table. Everybody could kind of down tools, mm. even though it's early. To get that result yeah. will show them they're worthy of being in the Premier League. They have to continue to earn it, but it's 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 days like that they're going to say we have the ability, and that's going to get a, give him a big pat on the back and more confidence from his players. Yeah, well done, Steve Cooper and Nottingham Forest. Great win against Liverpool. One of those that fans will be talking about. For years coming on, and we'll see how important it is come the end of the season. Does it kickstart a run between now and the World Cup break? Let's just move on. The um, last game that we'll, we'll go in depth it is Aston Villa 4, mm-hmm. Brentford 0. Talk to me, mate. We were watching this game. How does this happen after... You sack Steven Gerrard, yeah. I believe, on the coach yeah. on the way home after the midweek defeat. Yeah. Um, Fulham, and then his team come out and, and a 3 0 up in I don't know, like 15 minutes mm-hmm. or something crazy, showing all kinds of flair and forward run. Is this just a, is this an ode to, is, is this to what was happening under Stephen Gerrard, mm. or is this more of what the play the quality of players and maybe they weren't being put in the right place mm. to, to to put this out? Who does it sort of rest more on the players or the manager? The answer I want to give is I don't know because it's so yeah. frustrating. But I won't give that answer. You know, I think about Steven Gerrard. I'm, I doubt he watched the game today, mm. but he'd been so frustrated yeah. looking at that, <laughs> thinking, uh, "This is we, we, you, you and I, and Musty we, and, and Rebecca. We've talked about yeah. how good these, this team is, and, and the recruitment's been good, and how and how expressive they are, and should be up in the front areas, and they're not scoring. And and, mm. and then today they go out and they play free, and it's amazing when you do change managers, yeah. there is a, a, a freeness and a freshness. Uh, to their play. I mean, Ings, Bailey, Watkins, they all get on the yeah, score sheet. These yeah. are players we've been begging you know, mm-hmm. to get off the mark. Sure. And, and I just, 
I think the I think the onus is on the players. Anytime a manager gets gets sacked, yeah. the players have to look at themselves. No matter the situation, mm -hmm. have to look at themselves. And in this case, I think it's a really good squad. I think it's a really good talented players out there that should be doing far better than they were. And so, sure, you can talk about the manager that did this or that. Ultimately, you crossed that line. Yeah. And the effort was poor. They gave away terrible goals. Yeah. They weren't scoring up at the other end of the pitch. And they clearly have enough about them to score those goals. And so it's a little bit of a disappointment and frustration for when I look at how Steven Gerrard must be feeling. But, again, when you make a change, you expect yeah. you expect some sort of result or some sort of um, reaction they got there today. Uh -uh. I, I thought it reflected quite badly on the players because mm. of, of the quality you've talked about, the quality, the potential of what's in that team wasn't what we were seeing. Mm -mm. And it was interesting, Leon Bailey came out after the game and said it was nice to play free with energy. And I'm mm. thinking, well, what? So you weren't playing free mm -hmm. with energy? Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. that obviously points to either what the Correct. manager was doing or the way that you're playing or the way you've been told, which doesn't doesn't quite fit that, that well with me. But listen... Stephen Gerrard had his time. He couldn't quite work out the the the, the, con the conundrum that was you know mm. getting down. You you got Coutinho, you got Buendia, you got Leon Bailey, you got Ollie Watkins, you got Danny Ings, yeah. and you can't get a tune out of any of no. them. Then then something's wrong, and somebody else is going to have the chance to come in and and, and sort that out. At, and by at, the way, Billy. the person coming in is inheriting a really good squad. Yeah. this isn't one of those squads where we go. I got to sell all these players to bring in new. Yeah, players. they have a really good squad. You know, this squad. You take this squad on. Obviously, they've had some injuries. Mm. You could, you know, you go mid-table and then you start thinking about what, what comes next. Absolutely. Not a good day for Brentford. Thomas Frank, who I think was in the running for the Villa job, but maybe not so <laughs> after today. Listen, mate, great stuff. Let's move it just to a couple of results uh, from the weekend. Your old team, Everton 3, Crystal mm. Palace now, I think, showed us the value of having a centre-forward. Dominic Calvert-Lewin um, involved with the first goal, beautiful goal. And then Anthony Gordon with the tap and Dwight McNeil with, with the second. Just too good for Palace in the end, I think. You know, a centre-forward where Palace... Probably you think Palace need, actually, a centre-forward mm. who can score them the goals on a regular basis. Yeah, look, I, I think that Everton are building. We wanted to see Frank Lampard stave off relegation, get a few uh, transfer windows under his belt so he can bring in his own type of players. He started to do that. He, he started from the back defensively with Tarkovsky and, yeah. and, and Connor Cody. Brilliant. Bringing Adrisa Ganage back into, um, into the football club. I spoke to Seamus Coleman this week on Inside the Mind. It was a brilliant conversation. I asked him about, like, is, is this a real belief yeah. in, in the manager now? Yeah. And you can see it. He's getting mm. the best out of players like Owobi and Onana, yeah, who yeah. I really like. Yeah. Um, so, so you look at the team, you look at the way the fans have responded to the team and Frank Lampard, and there's a synergy now about Everton Football Club that they have been lacking for far too long. So if that continues and they continue to grow, there's still a few players short, but they'll get those in. I'm going to go to... Um the game I was watching, mm. Wolves nil, Leicester four. It's a Leicester team that's certainly showing a little bit more like themselves. Beat Leeds in, in midweek and, and, and we're really at it. Clean sheet. Uh, third clean sheet on the bounce today against Wolves. Uh, goals from Tillemans with, with an absolute beauty mm. uh, to get things going. Harvey Barnes gets a second. James Madison back in the team gets a third. And Jamie Vardy comes on mm. and gets, he gets himself a goal, which is important to him. So 4-0 win. Great win for, for Leicester. Three points, uh, and Wolves, I'm afraid, really, really second best. And Wolves are going to need to get somebody in that building pretty soon. It's a bit mm. rudderless. It's a bit... I always feel those situations where no one's really accountable when you, you have that interim manager. It's, it's not really anybody's fault. Not the players, not this guy, because I'm no. not in charge. I think they need to get somebody in. But I'm going to go for my underappreciated player of the week. Mm. And he's a player who... Kind of came in under the radar at Leicester because he didn't make many signings. He was the only outfield signing mm. with, with a, a goalkeeper. Wout Bass came in for something around $18, $19 million. He's Belgian international, played in, in, in France, been brought into the football club and very quietly gone about his business, um, marshalling a defence that's lost the likes of Johnny Evans and Fafana and um, Soyuncu, mm -hmm. who's not around. He looks like he's got a bit about him. He's good on the ball. Yes. I thought he was excellent today with the back four. He's the one who's drawing, bringing people up and organising out the back line. And for a team that, that has obviously had a real struggle, it must be a difficult time going into this football club because Leicester have been you know, the benchmark of what you know, small clubs can do. 
And he's gone in in time when, you know, big players are being sold. The talk about the manager getting the sack. Mm -hmm. Difficult period. He's gone in and really got his head down. And I think it looks like a really decent um, signing who, who might come good for them again in, in the way that Fafana had hasn't and moved on. So Leon Chu, we saw and looked like he's plateaued a bit. But uh, Walt Fass caught my eye today and he's my underappreciated performer of the week. Let's go to Leeds then. Leeds United. Mm -hmm. There's a story brewing here, my friend. Mm. Leeds 2, Fulham 3. Leeds 1-0 up through Rodrigo and end up losing the game 3-2. Uh, Not great scenes at the end, although the fans seem to be behind the, the, the team still and, and, and look like they were sort of applauding Je Jesse Marsh. But difficult times, difficult interview yeah. for, for Jesse Marsh. Is he going to see this one out? Is, it, is he, is he going to get through this? I think... Um, they've got Bournemouth and Zip Man City. I think that's right. Yeah, the next couple of games. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I believe that it's Ellen Road. As we know, it's an amazing place to play mm. when things are good. Yeah, and when times are tough, they're going to let you know about it. And so there is pressure. We talked about the uh, Zerbi, and when you don't win yeah. football matches uh, over a sustained period of time, pressure is naturally going to mount. We know Leeds are a good side. We know that they like to press the ball. They like to do all the things that make the game pretty. They yeah. try and hurry teams up, and they've gotten good results from that. Yeah. Oftentimes, what we see is they take the lead. They're in the game. They have opportunities. But just like with Conte and Spurs, yeah. sometimes there, there needs to be a little bit of a plan B, mm. and that is in the Premier League, in all of my experience, sometimes you just have to shut up shop. You just have to say, yeah. We, we, we have this here. We've yeah. done the hard part now. Let's defend as a unit. Yeah. You know, when I look at that third goal that Williams scored, yeah. it comes from a throw-in. Yeah. It, it, it's sloppy defending. They're doubling down on a throw-in. Mitrovic is in the corner of the box. Yeah. That just needs to be one player. There's a nutmeg there. There's a, a player dangling a, le dangling a leg. But all that happens, Tim, doesn't it? When you're on a bad run and yes. confidence goes yes. and everybody's not quite sure and a bit, well, a bit tentative. Yeah, well... It, 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 it's that. It's also, Robbie, you know bad habits yeah. are learned. This Leeds team, for all intents and purposes, learned a lot of bad habits defensively under mm. Marco uh, uh, Bielsa. Bielsa. Jesse Marsh doesn't want to play that particular yeah. way, yeah. but he's still dealing with players who have, been, yeah, who have learned bit, bad yeah. habits, yeah, particularly defensively. Point, yeah. But on the other side of it, my underappreciated player of the week is Alexander Mitrovic. I mean, Fulham... When I look at where they're on the table, seventh in seventh. the table. I mean, by the way, they're not going down. Yeah. It's, They've won five games now this season. They only won five all the last season they were up. Correct. And Mitrovic, Mitrovic, nine goals this season. In the last Premier League season, he only had three. Yeah. And he didn't play he didn't very often. Scotty Parker didn't play. He didn't he? play very often. And, and it's wonderful to see because I truly believe, and I can point to Ivan Tony and Jamie Vardy, yeah. and Mitrovic is like that. Goal scorers score goals. Mm. doesn't matter what league it is. Yeah. And he lit the championship up. And he should have had an, had an opportunity the last time they came in the league. Fair play, Scotty Parker wanted to play a different way. Yeah. But I tell you what, he is a man on a mission, and he is getting amongst the goals every single week. It's brilliant to watch. And, and I, think, I think because of he, – he will, he will take Fulham beyond where they expected to be this year. Yeah, Marcus Silva's doing a great job mm -hmm. there. But pressure on, is going to be on uh, Jesse Marsh, and I think it's mm -hmm. Liverpool and Spurs before the World Cup break. So he's got to get some points yeah. and, and got to get himself out of the bottom three now. The optics don't look good, do they? You know, your bottom three, no. you've got some big games to play. This is where Jesse's really going to have to just bunker down, get his head down, get his team right, get a couple of decent results and make sure he's in the job come the break. Listen, mate, listen, it's been great to catch up. It's another dramatic week in the Premier League. Newcastle go fourth with a win against Spurs. Normal service resumed for Man City and Erling Haaland. Liverpool lose their way in the forest and it was all square at the bridge with late goals for both teams as United and Chelsea share a point. We'll be back on Wednesday, that's October the 26th, which will be match week five of the Champions League. There's games that include Manchester City at Dortmund and Liverpool at Ajax. But for now, I'm Earl, he's Timmy. It's sort of one part of the two, Robbies. Thanks for watching and listening. Be safe, stay healthy. It's a good night from me. It's a good night from him. Good night.
Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch more videos all season long. For even more Premier League content, from original series to live matches, head over to Peacock and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend on USA Network and on Peacock. We will see you over there.